agreed to be uh, honorary chairman of our steering committee to show it was nonpartisan. But we, I, we argued, uh, I argued to uh, John McCain's campaign that it was in his interest, in fact, try and take this issue away, to jump ahead, to point out. And in fact, if you actually look at, at, at many of the things that uh, John McCain has said, he supported scientific integrity in Washington, an important point. So we argued that it would be that, that he could steal this issue. So that it seemed to me, politically, there were reasons for all the candidates to, to consider doing this. Uh, but uh, they decided there were other issues at hand, and they didn't want to want to do that. After things had settled down, and they're now two, one candidate from each major party, the question was, would we be able to get them in, involved in the debate? Now, the, the official presidential debates are determined a long time in advance and are kind of closed shop. We gained hope by the, by the early discussions between the candidates of perhaps having some single-issue forums, uh, town hall type forums, and we thought the science uh, uh, debate would be, would be fine for that, and we approached the candidates about that. Uh, as you've heard, that they've that they've uh, uh, that is not likely to happen. Now, we also uh, uh, contracted a major poll of of Ameri Americans to see whether what, what they thought about this. And eighty five percent of the U.S. public, when polled, said they wanted to hear the candidates debate science issues, 85% to the public. You might think that would, um, that would indicate to the candidates that it might be useful to do it. But the candidates haven't, and I think there are reasons for this, and I just want to briefly mention them. The candidates have long felt that science is not an issue they have to deal with, and, and science policy and science technology policy are, are not issues. And, and I think that there are lots of reasons for that. One is that, that the constituency for this issue isn't a social, a single issue. It's not like a abortion issue. It's not a, where you can have a voting block that will dependably always vote on that single issue. The scientific community cannot be, has never been thought of as a voting block. Okay. They, they're interested in specific issues, but they can't be relied upon to always vote the same way. And I think that's one factor. But the other factor that I want to mention has to do with the media. And it's, I mean, I deal with the media a lot. And I've and I know, and I've, and I've spoken here about the impediments to, talk, to talking about science in the media, so I won't go into detail here. But there's one thing that I learned that I never realized before. The real problem with having public policy be based on empirical evidence and science is a problem of the media, and it's an institutionalized problem. When we would get interviewed about science debate 2008, the, generally, the person that would be assigned by a newspaper and interviewed us would be a science reporter. The science reporter might be want to, able to want to write a story, but it turns out the science reporter isn't allowed to get a story on the political pages of a newspaper. That's reserved for the political reporters. And the political reporters are generally just as scared of science as the candidates. And so there's this institutional impediment. Science shouldn't be politicized. But science policy is an important part of public policy. But if you're talking to reporters, the reporters you talk to are never allowed generally to write or speak, if it's a radio program, a TV program, on, in the political part. So this is a problem, and it has to be dealt with. And I don't know how, and I never realized it until we saw it happen over and over again. Where we tried to get, during the time when we tried to get the primary in, in Pennsylvania, we couldn't get the political reporters. The scientific reporters were eager to write about it but they couldn't ever get it on the political pages. And so we have a, another severe problem of trying to relate these things as country. Now, whatever the cause of not getting a debate, and we haven't had one, and I'm not optimistic at this point, we decided to, first of all, we view our effort as a success. We've mobilized a tremendous number of people. We have, in certain sense, raised these issues in, in national media around the country, and in fact, they're um, uh, uh, you can go to our webpage and you'll see the reporting on this. Uh, this the issue of, of, of why um, the candidates would rather compare each other to Paris Hilton or, or, um, or Wrinkled Apple or whatever uh, uh, is, is more important to talk about than issues of substance, is something that, 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 that is being discussed in the media every now and then. But we're, what, our purpose was not just to, to do this in this election, but was to create a, a tradition where we might raise the level of, scientific, of presidential debate and congressional debates. We might raise the level of 
of discussion of public policy because an informed electorate is vital to a successful democracy. And so our, our plan is far longer term than this presidential election. What we have done at this point, and I'm just going to read them to end my little presentation, we have decided to issue to the, each of the candidates and their campaigns 14 questions. In fact, by the way, when we discussed the debates with them, we said, if you're afraid of the issues, we'll give you the questions in advance. Okay? We just want you to discuss these issues. We don't want to, we don't want to sh try and demonstrate your ignorance. We want you to think about these issues. So we even offered them the questions in advance. But now we've given them the 14 questions, and we've asked each of the campaigns to produce a written response to the 14 questions. And both campaigns have agreed to do that, and I expect within a week we'll have written responses. So that will, I think, be successful. We, have, we are also exploring science debates in other areas. In fact, in one state, which I'm not allowed to mention right now, we, there will be, I believe, a Senate debate on science issues. And um, we are co-sponsoring a public symposium on science and public policy in Minnesota. And so you should go to sciencedebate2008.com to learn more about these things. And, and the plan, as I say, is to set things in place so that the next presidential election, it doesn't seem so odd to imagine uh, a debate on the key issues of public policy that matter. And that congressional candidates will be encouraged to think about these issues as well and educate themselves and get their staff to educate themselves, which is the key thing. Uh, once again, only if, the, if we can get this in the public eye and the public is interested in these issues will the candidates begin to talk about them and then will the public begin to see in the media these questions discussed so that they could make rational choices when determining who will be their elected representatives. So let me just close with the 14 questions so you see the kind of uh, diversity of what we tried to talk about. And to see that we haven't, these are not provocative questions in that sense. Innovation. Science and technology have been responsible for half the growth of the American economy since World War II. But several recent reports question America's continued leadership in these vital areas. What policies will you support to ensure that America remains the world leader in innovation? Climate change. The Earth's climate is changing, and there's concern about the potentially adverse effects of these changes on life on the planet. What is your position on the following measures that have been proposed to address global climate change? A cap-and-trade system, a carbon tax, increased fuel economy standards, or research? Are there other policies you would support? And I have to say that, since I always have to make some statements that are provocative, that one of the things that isn't listed here is offshore drilling, okay? <laughs> which is completely irrelevant, <laughs> although it's rapidly becoming an issue in this campaign. Uh, energy. Many policymakers and scientists say energy security and sustainability are major problems facing the United States this century. What policies would you support to meet demand for energy while ensuring, ensuring an economically and environmentally sustainable future? Education. A comparison of 15-year-olds in 30 wealthy nations found that average science scores among U.S. students ranked 17th, while average U.S. math scores ranked 24th. What role do you think the federal government should play in preparing K-12 students for the science and technology-driven 21st century? National security. Science and technology are the core of national security like never before. What is your view of how science and technology can best be used to ensure national security, and where should we put our focus? Pandemics and biosecurity. Some estimates suggest that if H5N1 avian flu became a pandemic, it could kill more than 300 million people. In an area of constant and rapid international travel, what steps should the United States take to protect our, popul protect our population from global pandemics or deliberate biological attacks? 